British aristocrats were busy touring the world with their new super-accurate weapons, shooting anything they could find. The rhino was very nearly wiped out by the headhunters of the empire, and the fearsome zebra variant, the quagga, was extinguished altogether. The gun was starting to make a difference. But rifling didn't make the gun a real precision weapon until 1859, when accuracy became the obsession of a man who, it said, had the face of a baboon. Joseph Whitworth was a man with an extraordinary appetite for invention. He gave the world the knitting machine, a horse-drawn road sweeper, and even designs for a combine harvester. The man was an engineering god. At the Great Exhibition in 1851, his inventions, and 23 were on show, won more prizes than anyone else's. The face of a baboon, perhaps, but what a brain. He started out as an apprentice mechanic in his uncle's Derbyshire cotton mill. Young Joseph was not impressed. He complained that the workmanship was shoddy and that the machines were inefficient. This stubborn and difficult man found it all too messy and haphazard. While other engineers of the time were preoccupied with their huge machines and their Massive engines, Whitworth's world was getting smaller and smaller until eventually he ended up designing a measuring device called a micrometer, which had an accuracy of a millionth of an inch. That's about, that's about that. Maybe even smaller. This is Whitworth's micrometer, a machine that revolutionized engineering. Its arrival meant that for the first time, engineers could manufacture microscopically accurate machine parts, and that paved the way for standardization. This had a profound effect, because if you think about it, before Whitworth came along, you'd build a machine, make some nuts and bolts for it, then you'd build another machine and make some nuts and bolts for that. Nothing was ever interchangeable, because there was no way of making sure everything was exactly the same size. Now, because of Whitworth, because of his obsession with accuracy, it meant you could go to the shop, get a handful of nuts and bolts, and know that whichever ones you pulled out of the bag would fit together perfectly. Time after time after time. Without Whitworth's belligerent quest for perfection, the Industrial Revolution might well have ground to a halt. But thanks to standardization and accuracy, machine efficiency took a quantum leap and mass production took off. Whitworth saw room for improvement everywhere, and so it was with guns. He'd already established himself as Britain's top engineer and had been asked to look into the mass production of rifles by the government. After making his recommendations, Whitworth decided to have a go at the gun itself. It was bound to be rubbish, he reasoned. It had been made by someone else. Despite its recent successes in the Crimean War, Whitworth found the Army's Enfield rifle to be wrong in every particular. So he made them another one, better, more efficient, and above all, more accurate. Top of the target again, 12 o'clock, getting near the woodwork. In a bid to discover how good the new gun really was, the National Rifle Association are putting it up against the Enfield that caused all the offence in the first place. Ah, oh, that's just outside the black at one o'clock. Whitworth's rifle differed from the Enfield in just one crucial respect. A top spins. Everybody knows that when you spin a top, it wobbles at certain speeds of rotation, and at other speeds of rotation, it is absolutely steady. 
and it's exactly the same in a rifle. And Whitworth found that the rate of spin to make that bullet stable in the air was one turn in 20 inches against the original government rifle, which was one turn in 78 inches. He was so keen on his bullets spinning at the correct rate that he redesigned those too. They were hexagonal to fit perfectly in the twisted hexagonal barrel. Well, this is the group shot by the Enfield and as you can see we're running from almost the top of the target to almost the bottom uh, and virtually across the target that big. That is a large group and um, when we come over here the Whitworth group is much tighter. The width of the group is no more than that which is about nine inches. And let me give you an idea of just how accurate it was. Back then, a professional marksman using a conventional gun would reckon on being able to hit a target that was 200 yards away. But at the opening of the National Rifle Association in 1860, Queen Victoria, who preferred needlework to blowing holes in things, used one of these to hit the bullseye of a target that was 400 yards away. You'd have thought that the British Army would have fallen over themselves to buy Whitworth's gun, but they rejected it because the ball was too small. Who knows what could have happened if the army had used Whitworth's rifle? They certainly might have found it useful at Rourke's Drift 20 years later when the Zulus, thousands of them, appeared on the horizon. The range of Whitworth's rifle could have given the British a fighting chance. Whitworth was difficult and obsessive for sure, but he was a perfectionist. It's because of him and his ilk that Britain became the workshop of the world.